Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming in at 10 a.m. today. The session starts early on with uh, discussing the investor landscape of India. And no better person to share that experience than Ashish Vadwani himself. Ashish is the managing partner of Ivy Cap Ventures Private Limited. He has over 25 years of experience in venture capital, M&A, and strategy consulting. Ivy Cap is a venture capital fund built around the alumni of premier institutions of India and manage about 125 million US dollars of capital. During his career, Ashish has worked with companies across the investment life cycle from incubation to exit. He has led and managed investments across technology, consumer, and traditional industries. He has also led a NASDAQ listing and worked on several m and transactions. Ashish has also found and run his own ventures and has been a member of a board of several companies across APAC region. He's currently serving as a board member of Thai Singapore. Welcome, Ashish. Thank you, Siddhi. Uh, that's quite generous. So, uh, you know, what I wanted to do today is, you know, talk a little bit about uh, what are the emerging trends, particularly focused around e-commerce and allied or supporting uh, industries. Uh, and then I'll then talk about, then probably open it up for a discussion uh, where you ask a bunch of questions and let's make it free flowing uh, because I think that's the best way for you to get whatever you all want rather than listening to what I want to tell you, right? Uh, so, you know, I think we, uh, I mean, I think you're all broadly familiar with e-commerce. I think e-commerce in India is, I would say, uh, somewhat in the mature growth phase. Uh, so we, we do have the horizontals now well-established, uh, whether it is Amazon or a Flipkart. Uh, of course, Geo is coming in a big way. Uh, and there are some other platforms also which are sort of uh, established. Uh, and there is, a, I would say, uh, some, some growth in verticals. So we, we have some, some verticals which are seen, which have seen a lot of movement. Uh, obviously, you know, if you take a broader view of e-commerce, then obviously travel, is one such segment, uh, you know, uh, music to some extent, uh, but it's still very early days. I think there's a lot of growth left uh, within e-commerce and particularly around vertical e-commerce. Uh, so why do I say that? I think there is a lot of stats around that. I mean, today there are about, you know, uh, 700 million people, I think, uh, who are on the internet. Uh, there are only about 100 million shoppers so far. Uh, COVID has probably expanded the user base, uh, so it's a, it's actually a flip in the in the uh, for the industry. Uh, now, looking at it other ways, I mean, if you take the penetration of e-commerce uh, <clears throat> in various segments and sectors. I think it's in apparel, it is still probably less than, in, in, in the single digit and probably less than 5% uh, in overall apparel. I mean, if you take electronics, probably it's slightly higher. Uh, personal care, et cetera, will be maybe closer to eight, 10% maybe around around 10%. I mean, I'm not giving you exact data, so don't quote this data, but it'll, uh, th this, is, this is more directional. So it may be plus minus, you know, uh, a few percentage points, but that's, that's where it is. And, and a large part of India, uh, and, and, and largely the, the current growth of the market is driven by, uh, you know, what we, basically the 15 to 35 segment, uh, uh, mostly urban, uh, you know, uh, slightly higher earners, uh, but it's not penetrated deep enough yet. 
in the hinterland you know tier 3 tier 4 is exciting we are seeing a lot of growth over there i'll talk about that separately uh, but it's not really penetrated uh, deep enough amongst the 1.3 billion people so i think uh, that's why i call it a a phase of mature growth because though it's been around for now some time and there are fairly large companies sitting there uh, but the growth is yet to come uh, i think there is still a lot of growth left uh, and uh, so that's the sort of top line now talking about some of the things that i see happening obviously this battle amongst horizontals is going to be very interesting i mean uh, we haven't seen that uh, that global players come and uh, fight with local players in a really large market or compete where i should say fight compete with uh, with players in a in a very large market so you know china has its own ecosystem us has its own ecosystem uh you know so uh and 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 most of the the rest of the world the larger countries uh, have adopted uh you know one or two but uh here you have uh you know you have you know sort of amazon flipkart which is now walmart and you have now geo coming in perhaps even the tatas will come in uh we have uh you know you could uh, think of paytm as a horizontal uh, at least they had aspirations to be one uh, i don't know what what will happen post uh, you know 2020 but uh, I, I, they had aspirations to be one so but that that's interesting because i think you will have different models coming out here uh, and also it's interesting for sellers because it gives you a choice of platforms uh otherwise the bargaining power of a single platform or two platforms uh, across 1.3 billion people is 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 really very high i'm not saying the bargaining power of platforms will reduce in any way but certainly uh, it it remains to be high uh i think uh, so few things one is i think further penetration which is a point i spoke about that's one trend Uh, already we are seeing uh, with covid uh, and even before covid i think a lot of interest in tier 3 tier 4 towns uh, we hope this will go rural but rural will require a different kind of model uh, it's not going to be uh, simply order and deliver at home and cash on delivery i think the the logistics is far too complex to say that uh, you know in a village in the middle of let's say uh, in somewhere in east india uh, 500 kilometers from kolkata uh, somebody can order and next day he is going to get delivery uh, at his home uh, i think that model is is very hard i mean it may be uh, I, but I, i do see and we have seen models where people are trying to build a hybrid kind of system where you aggregate demand and then try to get uh, e-commerce going so we are going to see uh, perhaps different models as as we penetrate tier 4 and rural uh, we also in terms of penetration we also see uh, far newer segments so we are seeing not just the 15 to 35 but uh, people starting to order Uh, online a lot more particularly you know i think covid has given that a flip uh, uh, certainly those who are not used to ordering first time customers are are coming in uh, and and that's a good thing i think uh, in any case as time goes by that 15 to 35 a reason why a lot of let's say 50 55 60 plus people don't order is is uh, online is because they are not technology savvy because they have the habit of you know touch and feel uh, but as time goes by that obviously that 15 to 35 will naturally expand so uh, there is i mean there is a natural expansion of the market taking place anyway uh, so from an age point of view and demographics point of view uh, 
we we also see women uh, more women come in particularly during covid times uh, you know buying online uh, so in general uh, penetration whether it is geography by age uh, or uh, demographics it's increasing uh, the second uh, interesting trend is uh, around the uh, what you see in verticals uh, now obviously uh, again taking a much broader view food is a is a is a good example uh, we've we've got horizontal platforms in zomato and swiggy uh, but there's also a cloud kitchen uh, boom happening uh, today if a zomato wants to and this is very very surprising today if a zomato wants to to onboard let's say a north indian chain in north india uh, to provide north indian food to north india there is no such chain you know uh, there is no one there are lots restaurants are there are few restaurant chains but they are still small they are not available across let's say uh, you know top 100 uh, towns and cities or not even amongst the top 25 towns and cities uh, they are probably present in half a dozen cities so they can't provide these horizontal food platforms uh the ease of scale because otherwise these platforms have to go and onboard individual suppliers which they do anyway but it's not like getting pizza hut or or a pizza chain or a a noodles chain or something like that right so uh, i think there is a lot of scope for uh, cloud kitchens uh both selling through platforms and selling individually uh incidentally we have made an investment in biryani by kilo uh, which is a biryani uh, you know a biryani cloud kitchen delivery model and uh, interestingly biryani is the largest category uh, that sells on swiggy and zomato but we don't have a national chain uh we don't i mean there are some restaurants uh, which are specialized around hyderabad or 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 chennai or which want to build a an offline chain or which have where you know private equity is has invested to build an offline chain and they want to use the restaurant to do the delivery uh, but that's a very different uh, difficult uh, task to achieve Uh, because a cloud kitchen has some very significant advantages as compared to a restaurant you know delivery i mean the the cultures are different the the service levels are different uh, the speed of execution is different uh, the dependency on on the on the chef and the kitchen structure is very different so uh, the fact is we don't have enough cloud kitchen chains so that's clearly one example in in food uh which which makes sense um uh, similarly i mean if you take beauty i mean i think beauty uh, and uh, is is a space uh, we've also invested in through purple uh there are what's what's happening in beauty is very interesting i think there are a lot of brands which are older you know uh, and they are just continuing and there are some uh the millennials don't want something new they want new attributes you know uh if you ask uh, uh my mother does she buy a vegan soap i mean does she buy look for labels around animal atrocities no they don't uh, you know uh, a lot of upper middle class india grew up buying uh you know unilever and png products or maybe one or two uh, you know uh, other local companies uh naturals has gone in a in a big way uh that's a big trend and there's a uh, there's certainly a lack of products uh, lack of new brands a uh, lack of uh, brands in uh lack of products available a simple lack of products available in uh, in the in tier 3 tier 4 cities so uh we are seeing that simply being present with a good assortment of of brands which appeal to uh, online consumers uh, people are able to build uh, still small brands but i think they are able to make a start <coughs> excuse me uh 
I see a lot of play in the personal care and beauty segment. It's a huge market. And I think uh, still, you know, if you take basic shampoos, I mean, the, the great innovation, offline innovation in India was, was sachets, uh, which is basically you spend a couple of rupees and get uh, one use uh, sachets, which, you know, people expanded to two use. So the mother and daughter would use it or the father and the father and son, whatever. Uh, that caused some penetration, but I think there is still a lot of, lot of products and a lot of uh, innovation uh, 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 sort of there. I mean, an allied field is Femcare. One of our portfolio companies is looking at that. Two of our portfolio companies are looking at that. Uh, I mean, uh, other than P&G, uh, which has Whisper and which sort of 30 years ago ran a campaign to uh, to uh, to penetrate uh, the use of sanitary napkins amongst urban uh, girls, uh, there's not much done, uh, you know, not much done after that. I mean, today you're seeing new materials and, you know, uh, comfort and sort of new designs and uh, new brands coming up. And, 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 you know, I don't know the stats, but I would imagine a large number of women to still do not use sanitary napkins. Uh, and they can afford to. I mean, even Whisper is, is the spend of about 100, 200 rupees a month, which is not really that expensive for even a lower middle class household in India. So uh, it's an example of how there is a huge uh, market. There is a very large gap in terms of products availability and where online can help new brands come up and penetrate the market. So. Uh, that's 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 why I feel all these verticals. I, I think take take lingerie, another great example. We have an investment there uh, in 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 uh, in Clovia. Now, if you take uh, you know 1.3 billion people, 600 million plus women, uh, we don't have or we didn't have a single national lingerie brand. Uh, we don't have a single national nightwear uh, brand uh, and that's just amazing i mean obviously uh, women are 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 wearing innerwear and they're wearing uh, nightwear uh, but these are all localized local brands where no products uh, innovation has taken place for the last 20 30 40 50 years so and, and most likely this girl who is you know, 20 plus, who's got a reasonably well-paying job, does not want to wear the same inner wear as her grandmother did, you know? Uh, so it's a, like a market there to be taken. Uh, so, uh, and we find so much tailwinds. I mean, even without much marketing spend, our company grows 40 to 50% uh, annually. And if you sort of uh, put in some marketing spend, it, it can easily double every uh, every year. Uh, so another example of sort of, uh, you know, vertical, uh, uh, you know, verticalization, I think even in eye care, we have seen a fairly successful startup, Lenscart, uh, doing omni-channel now. Uh, I'm sure there's space for a lot more. There are lots of needs, need gaps, which are not satisfied. Uh, and the list goes just on and on and on. I mean, uh, <clears throat> sports, for instance, uh, you know, not penetrated. Uh, uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, lots of things uh, which are which are not taken care of. And if you take a slightly more broader definition of uh, e-commerce. And if you want to include include education over there, I mean, not even started. I mean, you have one one name, but I think uh, it's just you know on the tip of the iceberg. There's lots to do. The market is huge. Indians love to spend on education, and and they, they are spending on education. Uh, so so it's just waiting for the right type of models, uh, the right type of entrepreneurs to come and back it. Uh, healthcare will be the same. I think healthcare there is some. Uh, 
I think very supportive uh, regulations that have come in to to drive healthcare uh, outcomes. Uh, you know, using online, uh, you know, telemedicine and and, and teleconsultation, etc. So, uh, the the point being, verticalization is a very very big play. Uh, I think the third one I'd like to talk about is premiumization. I think uh, premiumization and maybe allied to that personalization. I think India is known traditionally as a value for money market or a low cost market. So most segments, I think you will find a base at the lowest price is a huge base. And then the, 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 the pyramid is very sharp and there's a very small amount of uh, premium buyers for any category, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, except maybe for jewelry, because uh, people just keep buying gold endless, endlessly, they don't buy fakes. Uh, but that's just a joke. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I, I, I see that the premium segment with its level of service, with its level of product innovation uh, has yet to happen. I think next 10 years, you will see a lot more of that. There's a critical mass of customers who don't mind paying international prices for the best brands and the best uh, uh, products available internationally. And that's not been well serviced as yet. So I think premiumization is another thing which, which, is, uh, which is a big one. Uh, I touched upon it a little bit, but I'd like to call it out. <laughs> I think uh, the rural consumer uh, is, is a very interesting one, unserved, uh, very new. Uh, the government is now has a plan is, which is already being implemented uh, and it has made a lot of progress uh, to bring broadband to every single village in India. Uh, what it does to education, healthcare, consumption, banking, you know, it just potentially transforms uh, how people consume. And I don't even think we have scratched the surface on uh, what kind of models will work in each sector for the rural or even as a horizontal in rural. I think there is some, we've made an investment in a semi-urban rural uh, fintech kind of play uh, with the idea of growing a new bank around it. Uh, but frankly, people are just trying to understand it. I mean, it's so early days. So it's a very untapped market. And as I said earlier, uh, that customer has a different product need. It had a different price point. Servicing him cannot be done by the existing infrastructure. Uh, I mean, you can't take, uh, uh, he, he, they work on different languages, uh, live different literacy rates. So you have to build an entire, uh, ecosystem out there or an entire business model out there to create that ecosystem. So I think these are the top four trends that uh, I have at the top of my mind. I'm sure there are lots, lots more, uh, but uh, you know, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, don't go by the headline pink page kind of uh, business uh, news columns that, oh, the market is taking. I think there's one very uh, a big myth, which is around oh, geo is coming and geo will take away all all segments. I think I find even even uh, uh, CEOs of startups, you know, talking like that, and I'm I'm just amazed at at that statement. I mean, that's that just doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, uh, yes, geo is a big company. They will drive change. They will sort of build an ecosystem, but there is so much opportunity, so many gaps that uh, anyone who applies the mind has the right passion, has the right team, knows that space uh, can go in and create a fairly large business in India out of it. Uh, as far as investors go, uh, I think, uh, let me spend a few minutes on that. I think uh, we, uh, I mean, we have a fairly large number of angels and angel clubs in India. Uh, and, and they are constantly investing in newer ideas. Uh, 
we have now a fairly large number of series A, series B players, uh, including the likes of, uh, in, uh, and, and they fall into multiple categories. They, you know, one is the sort of uh, global names who have come to India, the likes of Sikoa and Axel and uh, so on. Uh, you know, there there are the homegrown ones, uh, which includes Ivy Cap. Ivy Cap, incidentally, is the largest homegrown VC in India because we have raised the largest amount of domestic funds uh, in India. So, uh, so, uh, and there are lots of micro funds, which are 15, 20, 30, 40 million in size. Uh, up to 100 million in size or up to 70, 75 million in size who are, who are active in the pre-series A, series A space. Uh, where it gets challenging is, uh, I think, series B, C, D. Uh, B also, there are enough players. I think we also do B, uh, quite a few people. Where it gets challenging is series C and series B. Uh, not too many large uh, uh, players, uh, uh, fewer players. Uh, and uh, everyone is enamored by the big check writers, you know, the likes of the SoftBank, Tiger, and so on. Uh, I think that tends to make uh, make front page news and get everyone excited, and therefore it has a role. But I would like to see a large, robust uh, Series C, Series D ecosystem, uh, which which funds even, uh, you know which doesn't always look for, for a unicorn. I mean, and here is, I like to debate a, uh, on a point. I mean, of course it's great to have unicorns and, and India will have many unicorns uh, just given the sheer size. I mean, we'll, we're, it's projected that in the next 10 years we'll get up to about, nine, I think it's 95 is the number that I've seen, 95 unicorns, uh, which, is, which is not bad. Uh, <clears throat> but if you look at, uh, India, and, and, and it's true also for Southeast Asia, I think a lot of MA and a lot of action happens in the 100 to 200 million uh, dollar size companies. And uh, it's typically Series A valuation are less than 10 million. So if I'm investing in a 10 million company and taking it to 100, 150 million and exiting, I think. First of all, a $150 million, $200 million business uh, in value is, is not a bad business at all. And if you're selling it for that price, I think founders are happy, uh, employees are happy, uh, investors, most investors would be happy, uh, and the LPs of investors would be happy. So let's not... The point I'm making is, yes, go aim for the unicorn. Yes, of course, uh, if you can. But don't get so enamored by it that you forget that a bulk of the action, uh, M&A action, listing action is in the $100, $200 million space. And that's a very, very important uh, thing for me because I think we can deliver superior returns uh, by having uh, maybe one or two unicorns in our portfolio, but a healthy number of companies that we can exit at 100, 200 million dollars. In fact, even less than 100. I mean, uh, if you even exit at 70 million, let's say that's, uh, you know, close to 500 crores. <coughs> Not bad if you have come in at, you know, a valuation of 5 million or, 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 or 7, 8 million, right? Uh, so so uh, look for those opportunities also. Uh, so I'd like to see a robust, uh, healthy series C, C and D, uh, which work on a much broader set of startups uh, in terms of value. Uh, and, and, and that's a progress. I think there is some very interesting developments where now Indian startups are being going to be allowed to list overseas uh, without having a listing in India. So earlier the rule was if you have to list overseas, you need to have some listing in India and to have a listing in India, you need to have some kind of a profitable record. Uh, if you don't have that profitable record, then you know the market is not used to it. It sees you differently. But I think opening up to, uh, to uh, uh, overseas listing uh, will be a huge flip 
uh, to the Indian uh, VC ecosystem because ultimately uh, it, it's like a pipe, right? The more there is suction at this end, as in at the exit end, so the more there is m a the more there is IPOs, the more there is buyouts, uh, the more money will flow into into startups, right? So uh, uh, I'm I'm I hope uh, that the uh, the other side of the pipe where you create uh, that pre uh, the demand for uh, for good uh, startup companies, whether it's in B two C tech or whatever space, uh, they need to uh, they they they'll, they'll make the ecosystem go even larger. I think I've not done enough justice to the space surrounding the e commerce uh, ecosystem. I think the supply chain logistics, uh, martech, ad tech, tremendous amount of opportunity. Uh, we are seeing smaller companies, SaaS companies uh, grow. Uh, we have a few in our portfolio. Uh, they haven't achieved the scale that you know, uh, Silicon Valley may, might like, but uh, they are making a dent in India. They are making a dent in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think, again, you can create uh, 100 to 200 million dollar companies in this space very easily and you there is enough space enough scale to be able to create uh, you know uh, unicorns in the space so the a healthy mix of large winners and niche winners uh, so uh, i think uh, and again that space is you know as e-commerce grows uh, each of these spaces will grow uh, and as digital grows, uh, Martech will grow, ad tech will grow. Uh, so there is no doubt in my mind that uh, these sectors are very attractive. We are constantly looking at it for more investment. So I think I may have spoken more than Siddhi wanted me to. So let me just stop and start to take more questions. I mean, uh, that's the problem having a mic in front of you you just keep talking right so let me just pause here no ashish we, uh, this was a very interesting conversation and um, uh, one question that i had before i open it up to uh, to the startups from an investor uh, from from wearing an investor's hat what do you think an investor is keenly looking at especially at early stage companies what key parameters do you think an invest, a company or a startup in the e-commerce supply chain or logistic tech field should have, which kind of excites the investor to say, hey, you know what, I want to hear more. I think, I mean, there are some cliche answers to it and let me get done with the cliche on this, uh, answers. Obviously the, uh, the founding team and their passion and their knowledge of the space. <laughs> the space itself, uh, you know, and, and what kind of a business model uh, are they creating? I think these are uh, the top three very high level uh, sort of issues. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? I just uh, felt that there is a change in, yeah, okay. Uh, <coughs> so those are the top three very high level, but I think what we look for is we deep dive into uh, into each of these. And I think, let me start with the space. I think uh, from a e-commerce perspective, we are looking at each space and trying to understand what the market opportunities are out there, right? Uh, we are not only looking at, oh, this model succeeded in China, this model succeeded in India, therefore bring it up and put it in, right? Uh, so we are looking at what opportunities exist out there. Uh, right now, obviously, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not saying we will not look at op at what has worked in the rest of the world, but I'm saying that a lot more uh, sound businesses can be got if you deep dive into that particular uh, space and try and understand what are the opportunities uh, to create an online business out of it. Right. Uh, I think the second is around. Uh, business models. Uh, we have right from the beginning, uh, and this is our, our uh, sort of, you can say, style or 
our criteria. We have always looked at unit economics. Uh, it's not it's not a term that uh, we coined after the WeWorks disaster, uh, IPO disaster. Uh, we didn't we didn't coin it after COVID. Uh, right from 2011, 12, when we started looking at the first deal, uh, we felt that you must have good unit economics. Uh, and to me, that's, I think there was a dip in the B2C space in 2014, 15, uh, actually a boom and then a bust. Uh, so we wrote that with the same, uh, with the same criteria uh, unit economics, because ultimately uh, giving something free to the consumer or selling it below cost. Uh, I mean, there's no great art in that, right? There's no great science or art. There's no skill required. In that. I mean, you, you just take the VC money and spread it around and so on. And, and, and again, let me, I'm not I'm not dismissing the idea of capturing market share. There are certain type of businesses which create monopolies or oligopolies and where you need to get that scale fast. And over there, that makes sense. But over the last 10 years, we have found too many entrepreneurs uh, uh, quoting, you know, thinking that they are in Amazon and they can just you know, make losses. So, I think make losses is a different thing, but at least have decent unit economics. Uh, and why is that important? First of all, at least for an investor, you are convinced that the consumer is buying because, and he's paying for it because he sees certain value. He's not buying because he went to five websites and found that this is 35% more cheaper than the next one and therefore bought it, right? Uh, secondly, uh, it's very hard to scale up your price positioning. I mean, once you are positioned at a certain point in pricing, it's very hard to tell the same customer from tomorrow morning, I'm going to charge you 35% more. So it becomes very difficult to say, oh, when I'm bigger, I will start charging more. Uh, again, that's true for monopoly companies. Those who get to monopoly positions or those who are able to create a big brand but not necessarily for, for all businesses. So we, we like companies which have healthy unit economics. And by the way, the rest of it is math. I mean, if you have good gross margins, right? And if you are good at acquiring customers at a reasonable cost, then your bottom lines at some scale will turn positive, right? And hopefully you are in a larger enough market segment where you can get to that scale. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I mean, given the cost structures in India, the, that scale is not much. I mean, in India, if you create a 100, 150 crore brand, which is not, which is what? About $20 million, right? $25 million brand, uh, even less. I mean, $20 million brand, I think that has to be profitable. There's no reason why it should not be profitable at an EBITDA level. Right, and from there on, the market, and if you've chosen the market segment and, and product correctly, you should be able to scale uh, almost infinitely because the market is so huge. So uh, <clears throat> I think we look at unit economics quite seriously. Uh, from a founder perspective, uh, I think one of the reasons why we have chosen, uh, you know, the uh, we like to work with professional background founders, uh, particularly those who have a deep domain. So I always believe that value is to be created where deep domain expertise meets technology. So if I know a certain space well, uh, let's say I know how to set up oil pipelines well, and then I can leverage all kinds of technologies, including IoT, this, that, and the other, uh, to create new business models, to, to, to have new offerings for my customer to, uh, to really uh, do well. Uh, so uh, we look for the deep domain and technology overlap. Uh, we look for uh, 
And I think the backgrounds are important. Uh, I personally uh, like to spend almost two hours with an entrepreneur just talking about what life choices he has made. And that tells me the how he's motivated and what he's really, how far is he motivated, right? I mean, uh, yes, if someone tells me that if I spend three years and make a billion dollars, I mean, I think 90% of humanity would be motivated uh, or at least maybe a large number would be motivated. Uh, but, uh, you know, is he able to go through cycles, right? And that's the big test. Uh, how is there evidence that he has really pushed something that he likes doing in life? You know, has he, has he gone through a, <clears throat> through a dip before? Uh, you know, and how entrepreneurial has he been? Uh, uh, you know, the other criteria, which is very, very, very important for founders and perhaps the most neglected one is, uh, are you able to raise funds? Are you able to evangelize your companies? I mean, uh, as a founder, I think one of, I think the most important job that you have is evangelizing. You evangelize your product to your customers, you evangelize your company to your employees and leaders that you want to employ, and you evangelize <laughs> the entire business model to investors. So unless you do that and make, a, make it a habit to do that, uh, you're not gonna make progress. Uh, and when many times I think, and, and, and by the way, I think this is a Morgan Stanley study that the single largest variable uh, to define success in Chinese startups was the founder's ability to raise capital. So uh, I think many, many founders feel and they're good at what they do, their business. But then when I need to raise money, I'll just get this banker and he'll do a few calls and of course the money will come. And no, uh, you need to decide that I'm going to keep aside certain percentage of my time and spend it so that uh, I keep investors informed, keep targeting them, keep keep evangelizing my business and uh, understanding what they need, and and then when I need the money, go and take it. Right. So I think that's a very long answer to your question, Siddhi, and perhaps an incomplete one. I mean, there are obviously a lot more things you look at, but uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, mean I, I think one thing is implicit from what I'm seeing. We we obviously look at companies and business models. Where which can either become a leader or become a disruptor in that space. So we want to create that billion dollar company or that 100, 200 million dollar winners, uh, you know, that, that, that are possible. No, Ashish, um, uh, give, uh, give me two, three points to ask. And I'm sorry, folks, anyone who wants to ask questions, please uh, feel free to jump in any time. One thing that, that became very clear in your last point is, that you, you don't set up one time that, hey, now I'm going to raise money because now I need it. It's an ongoing relationship that you have to maintain. And then once you're ready, that is the time it's easy to capitalize and, and get that money in rather than waking up one day and saying, damn, it's very difficult to get the money in. So that's one thing that's really important uh, that the startup should, should create this pipeline from now when they don't need the money and start building those relationships so that when they need it, it's easier for them rather than waking up that time. That's one. Number two, Ashish, which you had mentioned early on is that unit economics. And you know, that whole idea of scaling and giving freebies is, is not valid only for certain markets, which is very essential that you should go into. My question here is that I've heard many investors saying that, hey, I need my money to be used for, for market capture. Don't worry, uh, just grab the numbers, grab the data, grab the members or the, you know, uh, your consumers, and then we'll see. So I've heard this many times and I know now after the whole WeWork fiasco, this is a, a thing of the past, but according to you, how do you, um, do you think there's a paradigm shift and, uh, in the investor's mindset or do they still want their money, maximum percentage of it uh, going into market capture? Or can I say, hey, you know what? I need this money for actually hiring more people, actually getting my my my, you know, work in order. But but that's something which the investors don't like listening to. They're like, hey, you know, that's your problem. But I need my money to be used in market capture, and I need a turnaround really quickly. So how do you manage those questions? 
No, I don't see a trade-off between market capture and employing people. I think the two have to go side and side. And yes, of course, we want you to grow and scale. But we want to, you know, there's something in public uh, markets, which is around quality of earnings. We want to, you to go and scale in, you know, in a proper way, right? If half your customers are freebies or are they're going to you know, jump off if you increase the price by two percentage points, then where is the differentiation in your product or your offering? Right? Where is the stickiness of the customer? After all, the valuation that I'm paying you is for the lifetime value of the customer divided by CAC, right? That's what is the, uh, not divided by CAC, compared to the CAC. Now, if, I, if you're acquiring these customers and then saying they, they are so non-sticky that they can jump off any time, then that kind of value capture is pretty meaningless, according to me, right? So, uh, <clears throat> again, there are many answers to, I, 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 I don't want to generalize. I think there are times when you have to market capture, if particularly you are going for a monopoly position or if there are if you have to break through the clutter of you know 15 or 20 similar looking uh, so so there are times to do that but i think you you cannot go wrong if you if you are scaling the right way and by the way i mean please understand that you know you are going to various stages of of fundraising and a time will come when the Series B, C, D investor, or even the IP, they will ask you what is the monetization potential of what you have, right? That you cannot escape that question. Now you either start building it layer by layer, or you then come to a point and say, hey, you know, uh, I'm having problems in funding because I can't monetize it well, or my customers are not sticky. So we have uh, we have followed. Uh, you know, a much more, uh, I would say, cautious approach where we look for quality of growth. Uh, of course, we love, we, are, we want growth. I mean, we will be very unhappy if our companies are not growing. Uh, but the quality of growth is very important. Got it. Uh, um, I, Ashish, I, I'll have a one-on-one -on -one with you separately because I don't want to monopolize this whole session. Sure. But folks, please feel free to uh, ask questions. Uh, uh, hi, Ashish. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Dana here from Ulavi. Um, hi, so I have a, a similar question uh, with, with this pandemic around uh, and um, some of the sectors being uh, really um, shied away by the, by the investor of all sort. Uh, what is your advice for startups who are in travel, mobility, hospitality, uh, those kind of sectors which are not the favor or, or the go-to sector as of now? Uh, so what is your advice for them? Look, I think Dhana, we discussed that separately, but let me, let me uh, sort of summarize some of the points. If you're in a sector which has been hit badly, uh, the first principle is you must have the cash to fight another day, right? Now, if you have the cash, then you, depending on the amount of cash you have, and I think you should have a 12 to 15 month runway, you chart out what is it, how do you prioritize growth versus scaling versus build up versus investment, et cetera, right? Now, <clears throat> and, and, there are some companies who might have just raised and they have 12 to 15 months of runway and they can they can keep going, no problem. Uh, you, you keep going, maybe innovating for when life will come back. Uh, but for a large majority of younger ones who probably have very limited cash or no cash, I think the, the only option is to hunker down, hibernate, look for alternate revenue models, where, where first of all, you can survive, right? Uh, and then depending on the cash that you have, you, you sort of chart out, how do you prioritize what you want to do? Because obviously there's very less demand, that's the big problem. So maybe you just want to focus on 
one or two markets where there is some demand, get some you know, revenues, cash flows going. Uh, the other thing is there will always be uh, investors who are slightly contrarian. So if you have a model which is very unique and which is you know, really, success, uh, really successful, uh, you, you, you may still get funded. Uh, at least in, in in smaller chunks, uh, though uh, that that ba- that the bar for that is quite high. So I think it's it's very very simple. First priority is survival. Uh, second priority is uh, to have enough capital to probably focus on how you can be stronger when you when the demand comes back. Uh, and sometimes you may also have to make hard choices. Great, great. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing. I think um, we, we discussed in depth yesterday. Uh, but when it comes to the valuation or the follow-on question, uh, what uh, uh, startups in this domain, especially, uh, I think it's more a personal question, but uh, what we valued before COVID and now, um, how, how do we handle this situation? Because... Um, I, I'm also struggling with that. Uh, uh, so, so taking taking the next uh, uh, four quarters, um, uh, we, had, we don't see any visibility. So, and also the last three quarters, uh, we don't have numbers. Uh, so, what will be the uh, cutoff or benchmark for us to say that based on this uh, traction, uh, GMB and revenue, uh, I'm asking for this. So, how how do we go about doing that? So, especially on the valuation front. So I think, again, I will take a very practical approach to this, right? Mm -hmm. You will not get uh, the same valuation unless you are a a really superstar company uh, out there, which has got something so unique that people are willing to uh, wait for that to happen. Uh, And I I think most, most business models are not going to get that, right? Uh, so it's all about how much capital, particularly for stressed companies, it's all about how much capital I can raise at what value. And I think f- forget about pre-COVID numbers. I mean, I, I think uh, if you're badly hit, people will not look at pre-COVID numbers and give you valuation mm-hmm. on that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of a... Uh, <clears throat> uh, You've got to go back to again. I, 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 it's very hard to generalize. You know what, what valuation, but you've got to go back and see what is it that is inherently valuable in your company. I mean, I, if your revenues are zero, uh, then obviously you are like a startup, right? You, you just take seed funding. Uh, you just reboot, and again, if you have people on the cap table, you probably clean up your cap table. You know, you have a difficult time of writing it off, uh, getting in new investors and moving ahead. That is one very brutal surgical way of doing it. Uh, but that's an that's definitely a real possibility. I mean, uh, I don't think uh, you, can, you can justify uh, valuation to your new investors based on your what happened pre-COVID. Uh, but uh, I think, again, hard for me to answer, give a specific formula because I, various companies will be at various stages, but essentially take money where it's available if you are in a crisis, right? I mean, you can try and structure it with some clawback and say, okay, if the demand comes back uh, and I hit uh, something by 2022 March, then you should allow me to claw back and I think those kind of things investors may not mind, uh, but uh, certainly yeah. you've you know you've got to take you know in a distressed situation you've got to take the capital that that you get. Got it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, um, I'm not sure you can hear me. This is Caroline calling from the Kong Group. Hi, Caroline. How are you? Hello. I'm good, Ashish. Thank you. I'm here in Singapore and has my co-founder in Valley Gurgaon. He is Dhruv. 
and we are a <coughs> Singapore India startup of um, Singapore being the HQ and India is the key area of focus market for us. Um, totally agree with your point on premiumization. In fact, that is the route that we're going. Um, what we're doing is that we're helping foreign FMCG brands to land and expand in India, which we saw as a huge pain point for people because of the importers, the customs and the distributors that are high barriers to entry. So the market potential is there, definitely we agree as well as the affluence of the people that wants to upgrade their lifestyle with better products now. So we're this, we are at a point um, of our, I would say, startup journey where we are piloting with six Singapore companies on this uh, business solution that we have. So eventually we're gonna develop a service as a solution platform for this. Now we're at a journey where we want to do angel or seed stage fundraising. And I guess I noticed that IVCAP has this as well. And, um, and the last one that you had raised was in 2018. Um, would there be a third fund that IVCAP will be raising? No, oh, absolutely. Uh, we, we are uh, going to raise a $200 million fund next year. Oh, okay. Uh, which, which is soft committed, partially soft committed. And what advice would you give for people as nascent as us who um, really wouldn't be able to make, I guess, an educated or informed call on whether we should do angel or seed? Okay, so you let me just sort of summarize so that I understand it well. You, you have a startup which basically helps premium uh, brands get into India, uh, manage the entire customs, logistics, perhaps market entry uh, into India, right? Uh, mm. And launch, uh, obviously. Mm. So, so uh, and, and you, you're probably very, you're early stage and you're deciding whether, the question is whether we should take angel funding or seed funding or not. That's correct. So, we have proven, well, I guess the business is in, in itself, the concept is validated because we've got six Singapore companies piloting with us. The, right. the main premise of it is that the distributor and importer network is fragmented and most of the time people from foreign countries find that it's hard to trust them. And it is, a, it is synonymous with whether it's Singapore or or within Southeast Asia, at least these are the markets that we've spoken to, it is uniform throughout. So the trust and reliability is a huge concern. So we, we noticed that the products that are in India right now, which are pointed out also rightly at the beginning, is only the tip of the iceberg of the immense, immense number of products that could be in India, but prohibited because of this. So we have right now launched a solution to then trickle in the products um, by giving the process more transparency as well as reliability um, and streamlining the importers and distributors that way. So I guess at this point in time, um, incidentally, probably a little uh, thing that we like to say is Q Signage, one of the co-founders, Brian is also our mentor. And um, he has also suggested that we're now ready to do fundraising because we need a technology solution right after we do the pilot so that the process can be automated. And while well, I guess raising angel fund is great, we're also considering should we also do seed stage? Yeah, so I, I think uh, I'm going to give you a fairly controversial and probably contrarian answer, but I, it's mm -hmm. more from to help you think through this, right? Um, Raise money when you need it. Uh, and uh, there are various ways of raising. Uh, I mean, if you look at funds that your business needs, uh, the funds can be gotten in multiple ways. It's not only through funding. Uh, in fact, even your customers are source of funds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, raise money. Uh, when you need it and you're sure that you can deploy it in a in a very productive way because the money that you're raising is not cheap it's expensive 
yeah. your investors expect a very very high return from it and uh, <clears throat> i think specifically to your point uh, you if you and i think you're thinking of it the right way you need to digitize as much as possible uh, you need to create that tech platform which will help you efficiently uh, go through multi agency processes multi stakeholder processes uh, in an efficient manner uh, so uh, and for that you will need some talent and you will need uh, we need capital therefore right uh, typically that is something that Uh, angels and seed, and and I'm not going to make a distinction between angels and seed. I think, you know, I'm just going to say the first first lot of external capital. Uh, I think that is something that there is an appetite for people to fund. Uh, digitizing a set of multi multi stakeholder processes. Uh, I mean, it's non trivial to digitize shippers customs banks warehouses logistics providers mm. you know retailer i mean it's just completely non trivial so uh, you mm. have to that's a complex platform you will need money to build it it will take time it will take expertise mm. so it's something that i think there's reasonable appetite for people to fund at the uh, very early stage uh, so you should be talking to angel angel clubs and 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 by the way i think another very important principle work out your most conservative plan right okay uh and mm-hmm. typically my my benchmark is the company will take twice the amount of at least twice the amount of time to achieve that and at least mm-hmm. twice the amount of capital to achieve that so keep that in mind while raising money uh you don't want to build up Uh, build a tech piece of technology which is half complete you have only money right. to half complete it right so uh, work out the amount that you need <coughs> hmm. yours is a service business partly so i'm yes. sure you can sell services and that's that's another way to fund your business at the early stage uh, hmm. so you know see how much you are getting from your services uh, how much you need for external capital and uh, then go out and define your usage define your timelines uh, then go out and talk to angels and angel clubs and uh, get them okay thank you uh, also the last question i'm oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so go ahead caroline could uh, come in for tie stars as well what do you think sorry you're uh, asking no. me sidhi Yes, Ashish or Karan. Oh, most welcome. For, yeah, of course. Yeah, for Thai stars as well. What do you think? Of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Caroline, we've got a uh, mm. you know, a sort of an Thai angel uh, network, and mm. uh, we let startups, early stage startups, pitch via a program called Thai Stars, where um, mm. this was uh, Ashish's brainchild in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> so perhaps we could, uh, you know, separately, not in this call, separately, I'll, I'll get in touch with you, and you could pr- perhaps pitch there as well. Thank you. And what would be the next question? Yeah. What's the difference between Thai Stars, if that's the case, and Ivy Camp that we read about online? Oh, we. Um, oh. Sidi. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Thai Singapore is a non-profit, and yeah. Thai Stars is a very small uh, initiative. It's a program. It's not even a fund where mm-hmm. we get folks like Ashish and others. who come in and listen to early stage startup pitch and if they think they can help them raise funds they help them ivy cap is a full fledged venture capital fund which which invest in serious <laughs> series a level companies so totally different two different arms all together ashish is, is board yeah. member with us so that's why he's involved here this is his this is his give back so to say and ivy cap oh, is okay. his main work yeah so uh, ivy cap ivy cap is, is, is an accelerator then i guess Ivy Camp, Ivy Camp is part of yeah. the Ivy Camp is part of <clears throat> Ivy Camp where we mm. uh, it's a sort of a platform which helps uh, startups in connecting with mentors investors okay. uh, companies and so on so uh, it's not an angel or seed fund <laughs> though we do have some capital <clears throat> now attached to it but uh, it's it's more of for us trying to help so we invest series a but we are creating this as a 
sort of a pipeline so that we start getting early visibility of trends, deals, companies, entrepreneurs, uh, which will then flow into the fund. But it's okay. it's it's not a fund; it's it's more a platform. Mm. And okay. and Thai, by the way, is a global yeah. organization. Uh, you know, Singapore mm. is just one chapter. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, entrepreneurs giving back to entrepreneurs. I mean, that's the simplest way I can describe it. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. Sure. But thank you so much, Ashish. Thank you, Karen. Uh, folks, can I request you to switch on your videos when you're asking questions? That will be, um, or, or in general, have your videos open. It's good to interact with, you know, while seeing the face. Um, yeah. Uh, any I other apologize questions? for that. <laughs> not, not a problem at all. So, any other question, guys? All right then, uh, Ashish, are you comfortable if anyone uh, would have uh, for uh, future questions then we could uh, either connect you to them or share those questions from their side to you? I think just collate it together, Siddhi. I'm happy to answer more questions, uh, but just collate it together and I'll try to do it at one shot. Perfect, that sounds like a plan. So, so before we end, Ashish, first of all, thank you so much. Your, your insights are not only practical, but uh, it's off the fluff. That's what I tell everyone, that, that you don't go with what the hearsay is or the fluff is. You actually uh, provide information which the startups need. And sometimes it's blunt, and, but that is what is actually needed from a startup to grow further. So I personally also, even though I've done so many of these sessions, look forward to your sessions. Um, Thank you, uh, Folks, can I request everyone to switch on their video if possible? And we'll have one group snap before we close this session for today. Thank you once again, Ashish. This was really useful. Uh, just give me a second before we get everyone in for a video. All right. Guys, please say cheese. Thank you so much. See you all at 2 p.m. for our next session and have a great day. Thank you once again, Ashish.